So hi everyone, I'm Elisa and today I'm going to be interviewing Hoda. So let's dive right into some questions. So our first question is, could you tell us a little bit about your trajectory and how did you end up working at Brex? First, thank you for having me today. Um, in terms of my trajectory, I first got a PhD from MIT in Core 6 EECS uh, with a focus in machine learning. While I was in grad school, um, I uh, took a class at Sloan and got interested in um, the startup world. So we started a company with some of my classmates to help people at the base of the pyramid save money using their mobile phones. And so we entered the MIT 100K, the Harvard business competitions, and um, were able to raise some money. So after graduating, I ended up moving to Jordan. And after a couple of years of spending uh, time in Jordan, I decided that, you know, living in Jordan for personal reasons was not for me. And I wanted to come back to the States and I was pretty burned out from the startup. Uh, but I really enjoyed working and at younger companies. So I knew I wanted to stay at a startup of sorts. And so spent some time researching and figuring out what I might want to do next. And I ended up at a company called Color Genomics. You may have heard of them because they're doing a lot of the COVID tests right now. Um, but at that time, it was a company of eight people. I was the first data scientist. And the reason I decided to join them is that the founders were um, really experienced former entrepreneurs. So I thought there was a lot to learn from them while still being at a young company. So I joined them at the time it was helping women uh, predict their chances of breast and ovarian cancer and also men in terms of like passing on the genes to daughters um, of theirs. And, you know, I'm a big believer that everyone has a superpower. And at least in my case, I think that just having spent a lot of time studying machine learning that I wanted to hone in on that skill a bit more. So after uh, a, about a year, I decided to switch to a different company called Stitch Fix. And in specifically in this switch, I was looking for a company where its differentiating factor was data science and machine learning. And the reason for that is oftentimes when you kind of switch to a company where your skill set is the differentiating factor, you get to have a lot of autonomy, a lot of impact, um, and that was very exciting for me. So I joined Stitch Fix. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a personal styling company. At the time, uh, I was one of the earlier data scientists. I think the company was about 200 people. And I ended up staying on for five awesome, awesome years. Uh, we went through an IPO. It was like several thousand people uh, towards the end of my time there. And I learned a ton. And so as I was thinking about my next role, I realized that for me, at least personally, my sweet spot in terms of both learning and growth um, and just excitement, I would say, about joining a company is Series C company that has found product market fit and is about to go through hyper growth. And that was essentially my Stitch Fix journey. And, you know, I'm big, also a big believer that like when I think about my career, I think about it in two phases, learning and doing. So like learning, doing, learning, doing. And I learned a ton at Stitch Fix, so I wanted a chance at doing. And the opportunity came to lead the data science team at Brex, which is amazing. And they were a Series C product market fit company about to go through hyper growth. Um, they are um, also similar to Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix was not just a data-driven company, but a data-first company. And Brex also wants to do that. So the opportunity was really exciting to me. So I ended up joining Brex. The mission is also really exciting, helping small businesses grow. And yeah, that's that's the story. That sounds like such an exciting career plan. It sounds like you've had a lot of experience in a bunch of different areas. Um, so I guess we're kind of interested in your early career initially. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that you received a bachelor's in biomedical engineering before switching to EECS at MIT. Um, why did you make this transition and was it like difficult to switch majors? You're absolutely correct. So ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a physician of sorts, whether a surgeon or a pediatrician. I was all over the place, but I definitely wanted to be in medicine. So uh, when I ended up going to undergrad, I focused in biomedical engineering um, and my minor was in pre-med. And so I was 
set on going to med school, but when the time came to actually come, I realized that the journey for med school is quite long and there's a lot of different ways that you could have impact in the healthcare field without necessarily being a physician. And so got the amazing opportunity to come to MIT and MIT is supportive enough in that they will support you um, through whatever you, that you may wanna do. So the EECS department at MIT, yes, they were like very supportive. So I actually worked in wearable sensors for healthcare for my master's in the media lab. And then for my PhDs worked with um, Harvard Med School on, on systems biology related topics. So still kind of related to healthcare, not completely switching over to the more classic ECS topics. And in that sense, that was exciting to me because I was able to um, still be able to have impact on the field, but in a very different way. In terms of the switch, I think, well, you know, MIC is challenging. It's, it's a tough place to be. Um, and it's a very humbling place to be. That, that goes without saying. Uh, but the camaraderie that you find there is par none. Um, and, you know, like there were a lot of classes that, you know, as a especially pre-med biomedical engineering student, I didn't have um, when I came to UCS. So I had to take a bunch of classes from scratch. So classic probability like 6041 or the graduate version, 6431, um, 6003, uh, 6002. A lot of those I had to take from scratch while taking grad classes, but challenging but doable. And the amazing part about it is everyone at MIT is in it together and everyone is there to collaborate and be helpful and learn from one another. And so with a community like that, I think anything is possible if you put your mind to it. So I guess you sort of touched on this, but with your PhD, uh, for others interested in entrepreneurship in like machine learning, would you recommend getting a PhD or in hindsight, would you have preferred to like jump straight into industry? It's a great question. Um, and I don't think in fairness, I can answer like a blanket statement that would be applicable to everyone. I think everyone's situation may be different. I've heard of folks who started companies uh, coming out of their PhD research. So if you didn't get a PhD, that would be pretty impossible. I've heard of folks who, you know, right after school started something. So I think it's situational. The one thing that I will say is I'm a big believer of the concept of measure twice, but cut once. So, you know, in a given circumstance, you've done your homework, you've thought about all the possibilities and given all the information that you've had, you've made a decision. And so in that sense, I don't have any regrets. And if I were to go back in time and change something, I probably wouldn't be here and would be doing something else right now. So in that sense, no regrets. The other thing to also mention is with a PhD, um, you learn a lot about one specific topic and unless you end up going to academia or you know starting a company off of it, it's probably that specific information is probably not going to be useful in your life after graduation. The one skill that you do get is being able to handle ambiguity and be able to problem solve and have a framework for solving a problem using ambiguity. So that's something that you will gain through a PhD regardless, which could come handy throughout your life in many different sorts of applications. Yeah, so for students who are interested in getting a PhD, how would you suggest deciding on a school or a program to study at? I guess part of it is that skill set with um, learning how to problem solve with ambiguity. Um, keeping that in mind, um, it's, I think for me or in general, as folks think about um, a PhD in order to study, you may change your mind, you know, your professor may change school. So the thing that I generally optimize for is think about a program that's willing to support you. Think about it as, as you know, I still think about things in probabilities, like what's the probability that you can maximize finding something that really interests you. If you put all your eggs in one basket for like to go to a school for like one specific professor to work on one specific project, what if you're into it, you change your mind and you're no longer excited by it? Are there other folks that you may want to work with? So for me, it's more about the broader community, the broader school. Are there different professors or different areas of research that 
may be interesting to me? Will the department support me in, you know, taking classes in other departments and being able to explore other things rather than like taking a narrow po point of view towards it? But you're also talking to someone who's also changed a lot of majors and um, worked in a lot of different fields. So I may be biased in my answer in that sense. Um, but the one key thing that you will learn is how to solve problems with ambiguity, regardless of where you go. That's great advice. Um, even though you did earlier say no regrets, <laughs> is there anything you wish you had done differently in your undergraduate or graduate time? Let's see. Um, I, I didn't take classes. I took classes in many different departments throughout MIT, but I didn't take classes in Sloan in specific until towards later years. Um, and the idea out of the startup came out of one of those classes. So maybe taking classes in at Sloan or other places a bit earlier. But other than that, I think it was a pretty, it was some of the best years of my life. So uh, really enjoyed time in grad school. That's actually a really good transition into the next question, which is about like entrepreneurship. And so many of us who are listening are in STEM specific fields, but haven't had much experience with entrepreneurship. So are there any courses or tools possibly online that you would recommend using so we can learn more about it? Um, Sloan has some classes, uh, but other than that, honestly, the best way of learning is by doing. Um, so I would actually recommend, you know, if there's a startup that excites you, maybe reaching out to them for an internship over the summer. That's a great learning opportunity. If not, start your own thing. You, you, nothing will get you prepared for potentially starting your own company or joining a small st stage startup um, better than actually rolling up your sleeves and doing it. That's really good advice. Um, so for like companies that you're looking at, what makes an AI product or company appealing for you to advise or invest in? So typically for super early stage companies, so seed stage companies, uh, for me, the biggest thing to look at is the team because the idea inevitably will pivot until you find product market fit. Um, and so can you, is this a team that can, you know, pivot together? Is this a solid team that can execute? The team is the one thing that will be the constant, whereas the idea will inevitably change. So the most important thing I think as I look into a company is the team that's in place at that point in time. How do you determine like if a team is ideal or not? Good question. I mean, what's their experience, like their relevant experience to um, the area in which they're starting a company? What is their working dynamics? Do they complement each other or are they all the same kind of profile? Um, what's their track record previously, previous to joining this company? Um, how do they even like present the problem? How do they think about the startup? How do they think about the opportunity that's in play? There's a lot of latent factors as you meet a team that you can kind of assess, like, is this a solid team? Do I believe in this team? Can they execute? Um, things of that nature. So aside from choosing a good group of people to work with, uh, what's your biggest piece of advice for someone who's looking into building a startup or an AI backed product? Um, so especially early on, Starting a company is hard. It is very, very, very challenging. The highs can be really high, the lows can be super low, and it's like an emotional roller coaster that you go through. Um, in general, trying to find another community of folks who are either founders or surrounding yourself with a solid group of advisors is I, something I would really recommend because it can be a really lonely path, especially because more often than not, you hear about other companies' success or other companies' fundraising or other companies, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. And it's really easy to, you know, get discouraged. And there are days where you think, you know, I might not be able to hit payroll and pay everyone at the company. Or, and that, that's a huge, immense sense of responsibility. Or, and, and, or like, you know, 
there could be days where you're like, okay, I don't think this idea is going to work. Finding product market fit is incredibly hard. And so, or one day you might, you know, get a check from an investor after hearing 40 no's. I think there's so many high highs and so many low lows. I think in general emotions while starting a company are quite extreme. And so finding a group of people who can relate with you, who can empathize, who can give you advice, who can support you, whether they're your investors or your friends or other founders, which is probably the best, best thing you could do for yourself. Because if you're in a good state, then uh, you'd probably, the company can at least have the best shot it can. That's some really good advice for building a startup. Thank you for sharing. Um, do you have any final advice that you'd like to give students in general? Take risks. You're young. Um, take classes outside your, your um, major. Meet people. Don't eat lunch alone. Try and meet someone. These are times where, you know, you can meet interesting people, uh, come up with interesting ideas, take a chance, do things. Um, that, you know, are considered risky, but you're young and you can afford to do it. And they're always, they tend to be really good, you know, learning opportunities. So take risks while you're young in school, especially when you have an amazing support system like MIT. That's, That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, those were all the questions that we had today. And to save your time, we'd like to let you go, but we are really grateful that you took the time out of your day to answer some of our questions. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with you today.